Where does yoga come from? Just as the question, what is yoga? With this question too, there are many ways we can consider this and respond to this. And initially, there are, I think, three main things that I would like to emphasize and share. Consciousness, observation, and India. So, in the old tradition, one of the ways that yoga, yoga's origins are explained is that Shiva, the auspicious one, the one who is the lord of yogis, Yogishwara, who is Adi Yogi, the first yogi, who is the incarnate representation of that which is beyond representation, who symbolizes the all-inclusive consciousness. Shiva is the origin of yoga. In other words, consciousness is the origin of yoga. The idea in the Indian system is that consciousness cannot be separated from its capacity to see, feel, recognize. And consequently, one thing that conscious beings want, long for, crave, is recognition. Hence so the idea is that once, when there is consciousness, and consciousness in its wholeness, in its oneness, even though it is completely full, would like the thrill of recognition. And so is the idea that within itself, it issues forth, it manifests, it creates the realm of existence, the universe in all its vastness. And this universe allows consciousness the thrill of the journey home to remembering and recognition and recognizing the wholeness that it really is, that we really are, because we are part of that. So where does yoga come from? <laughs> it's the idea it comes from consciousness itself. And we are only able to invite yoga or experience yoga because we are conscious beings. All yoga techniques depend on and grow from the deployment of consciousness and the reality of conscious existence. So it's the idea that union or togetherness or harmony or yoga is really this deep innate natural desire of consciousness when it comes into manifestation. And so you could also say that yoga is the deepest longing of the human soul. That longing for connection, that longing for union, that longing to experience oneness is something that is very innate in a human being. When we come out of the womb, we want our mother's breast. When we were in the womb, we were in this deep symbiotic connection with her, with another, her heart and our heart. When we were feeding, her heart and our heart again were one, and this was a place of instant comfort. You can see a baby wailing, and then when they are there, that's, there's this, it, it can occur that there comes this instant pacification. When we feel, when the baby feels, this union. Similarly, I'm in the process of making a new yoga series called the Yoga Top 40, which uses songs and song titles as platforms to speak about practical yoga philosophy. And one of the song titles that I use is Whitney Houston's I Want to Dance with Somebody. Because <sighs> I do. It's a very normal human thing to want to dance with somebody, to play with somebody, to interact with somebody, to have that recognition, that mutuality. And so in the Indian system, Shiva, representing pure consciousness, also sometimes 
is represented as being in union with Shakti, the goddess who represents the manifest power of consciousness. And Shakti is sometimes referred to as the universe. She is this world of change. She is nature. And Shiva, meaning consciousness, the infinite creative potential. Maybe you've heard of another word that's a little bit like Shiva in Sanskrit. Maybe you've done it at the end of one of your asana practices. You know that posture where you lie on the ground like a corpse? What's it called? Shavasana. Shava means corpse, a lifeless corpse. But Shiva means infinite creative potential. What's the difference between Shava and Shiva? The difference is that the Shava has no Shakti. But Shiva contains Shakti. You cannot separate Shiva and Shakti. Really they are one, but we speak of them as two for convenience's sake. But the idea is that basically yoga is an innate drive, an innate tendency, a deep-rooted desire of the human consciousness. So where does it come from? It comes from our deep longing to return to the wholeness that is our source. So at the microcosmic level we've mentioned, we experience that oneness, that symbiosis in the womb. Cosmologically, it's the idea that we all come from this wholeness or this oneness. And it's our deep longing to return, to remember our innate capacity for integration so we can recover and re re recognize our capacity to be part of that whole. So where does yoga come from? It comes from consciousness and consciousness is desire for recognition. So when we are in this limited bodily incarnation we experience limitation, but we have a consciousness, we have self-reflexive awareness. We can watch ourselves, feel ourselves, notice ourselves. And so we have an inbuilt capacity to rec recognize. And the idea in yoga is if we bring all parts of ourselves into togetherness, we can experience this dancing with somebody, this feeling of bringing all the different mutually supportive pairs of opposites into cohesion in this container in this vehicle. So we could say yoga comes from consciousness and is a natural inclination of the conscious being. It's the deepest longing of the human heart and soul, I would say. Another idea, where does yoga come from? Yoga comes from observation. All the teachings of yoga have come from the observation of nature. The teachers who shared these teachings, who developed and formulated these teachings, were often known in Sanskrit as rishis. The tongue comes to the roof of the mouth, it's a, what's known as a murdanya sound in Sanskrit, so put the tongue to the roof of your mouth and say r, shi, rishi. A rishi, it's basically like, it means one who sees, but it's Basically, you could translate it, a rishi is a research scientist. It's a person who has deployed his or her gifts of awareness in such a way so that he or she can see very clearly. And so the rishis, they observed nature. They stopped, looked and listened. This is the basic yoga practice. We were taught it, if we were lucky, I don't know, if you, when I was at school anyway, I was taught the green cross code how to cross the road. But as I was taught the Green Cross Code, I was taught the foundational yoga practice. It's all about observation. Stop, look, listen. The rishis practiced this. They stopped, looked and listened. Now, one teacher from India who's quite well known is Gautama the Buddha. And Buddha means the awakened one. It's from the Sanskrit root bod. And there's the idea that he had his awakening under the Bodhi tree. Now, one Indian gentleman that I met memorably a few years ago, Satish Kumar, a conservationist, very interesting man, he, one of the beautiful stories he told the day I met him was that his mother 
when he was growing up in India, I always told him, see the Buddha, it wasn't that the Buddha became enlightened sitting under the tree, she said. It's because he spent time sitting under trees that he became enlightened, she said. Sitting under the tree, he communed with nature. In the sense, he observed life. William Blake said, what is it, if I remember the quote, to see the world in a grain of, to see infinity in an hour, in the world, to see the world in a grain of sand and infinity in an hour, something like that. But when you look at some part of nature closely, there's the idea it can open up and reveal so much of broader reality and existence. We are all pulsating beings. Hatha Yoga works with the reality of this pulsation. All of the yogic and tantric teachings are based on this observation of pulsating life. What is life if it's not a heartbeat or a breath cycle? So as when we stop, look and listen, we observe nature, we can start to recognize deeper truths or more fundamental aspects of the reality or truth or essence of existence. So yoga as the practical system that works with nature in and around us, that works with the reality of human nature and the broader, wider nature of which we are part, all of those practical teachings, they're based on empirical observation. It's interesting, you know, these days I have some friends who are really working hard to try to make yoga practices available at the point of need in the National Health Service in the United Kingdom. And in order for that to happen at the governmental level, they need to have peer review empirical tests to prove that it works. But the, you know, the curious thing about this is, the kind of ludicrous thing about this, is that yoga was peer review tested over hundreds of generations for thousands of years before it was distilled and encoded into the miracle mirror text of, for example, the Yoga Sutra or the Bhagavad Gita. The sutra form, sutra means literally stitch or thread. Every sutra is a little point, but that little stitch is the key to a vast body of teaching. Just like one stitch can hold a lot of fabric, every sutra is the key to a big body of teaching. And when the sutras, or the Gita for that matter, when these miracle mirror texts are studied traditionally, there's the idea that they're studied in context, in the context of our lives, and in the application of the teachings in those texts to our broader practice, which is the whole of our life. So already 2,000 plus years ago, when these texts, or when the Yoga Sutra, for example, was being set down, this was not a newly invented teaching. This was a teaching that had been thoroughly, thoroughly tested and then distilled into this very robust and resilient form, adaptable form, that is then presented by Patanjali in the Yoga Sutra. So, yoga comes from the observation of nature, and all the masters of the old tradition were rishis. They were people who stopped, looked, listened, and observed nature so keenly that their awareness was able to penetrate through to its subtler, deeper essence, or its subtler, deeper truths. And this is also a foundational practice in yoga. The yoga practitioner is always encouraged to work from gross to subtle. So we've mentioned it comes from consciousness and it comes from observation, the deployment of consciousness. Now, historically, a place in which the deployment of consciousness was able to elevate to a particularly refined state was the land that we now call India, known as Bharata or Bharata Varsha in Sanskrit the land of Sanskrit, Samskrita, the well-made language. And the yoga tradition is part of the Sanskrit tradition. It's part of this amazing culture. Because thousands of years ago, on the Indian subcontinent, there were periods and places of sustained peacefulness and abundance. It's, you know, imagine Thousands of years ago, there were so few human beings on the planet. It's a very abundant place. Now, in many parts of the world, there was a lot of um, conflict to get food and all that. But in the Indian lands, there was a lot of food available. 
and developed this um, culture that comes when people have the chance to stop, look and listen. When you're on the go, 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 when you're living the life of a nomad or a raider, it's not so easy to go deep. But when you have the chance to settle and stop, and observe the whole cycle of the seasons a little bit more keenly than if you're always on the go, then these deeper truths of existence start to open up. And this is what happened in India. People, some people, they had that opportunity and they took it, they investigated reality. When the belly is full and there's plenty of food around and there's no immediate threat, it's a natural thing for the human being to wander. And the rishis of the yoga tradition, they wandered, they looked with curiosity. That's what we need to look with when we practice yoga. One of my uh, asana teachers, this wonderful uh, teacher in Czech Republic called Master Chumpalik, he's in his 70s now, he always says you need to practice asana like a two-year-old child, full of curiosity and wonder. And the Because when you feel safe and you have enough, this curiosity and wonder can naturally get sparked. And once it's sparked, you can keep practicing it. The idea is, in the Indian system, the peak of a human life is not 20 or 30. The peak of a human life is about 85. And if we keep practicing and nurturing and exercising our sense of wonder and curiosity, we can continue to learn with the speed that young children and teenagers learn with all through our life, well into our senior years certainly all through middle age but the idea in india people had the chance to look deeply and so then emerged this absolutely incredible culture and the indian culture is it's absolutely amazing and it's quite shocking for me that um, the western academy is in great denial of this sometimes people say that so latin and greek and most European languages have many words that are cognates of Sanskrit words. In the 19th century, Western academics, particularly from Germany, also from the US, and Europe more broadly generally, encountered the amazing realm of Indology, once the British were in India. And they were puzzled and quite flabbergasted by the range and depth of this Indian culture and I think that their cultural conditionings and their idea of their own superiority blinded them to the greater depth and riches of the Indian tradition. They could not accept that these brown people that they were subjugating and exploiting, whose lands they were pillaging and whose people they were enslaving and taking advantage of in this colonial system, that they had, they were the uh, heirs and they had in their heritage a culture that was and a language that was much deeper vaster richer more complex nuanced and advanced than anything in the european tradition and when europe had literally been in the dark ages in the indian subcontinent they'd been living this very advanced culture so in sanskrit texts that date back many many centuries and sometimes thousands of years we have evidence of surgical procedures, we have evidence of atomic theory, we have evidence of complex mathematical theories. We have a literature that is much, much vaster than anything else that we find from any other tradition in the world. Not only that, but we have a literature that's thousands of years old. So, for example, in English, you know, well, English didn't exist a thousand years ago. How many texts exist from even 400 years ago, at the time of Shakespeare? A few, but very few. In the Sanskrit tradi tradition, we have texts on so many spheres of knowledge. On political science, jurisprudence, governance, the science of politi political science. We have works on aesthetics and pleasure. We have works on archery and the arts of the martial arts. We have works on health. We have works on music and 
architecture and sculpture and agriculture are all of these different arts and sciences so thoroughly developed thousands of years ago and yoga is a very very important part of this system because yoga as we mentioned in the videos from the previous week yoga is the practical school of Indian philosophy and interestingly any art or science can become a yoga if it is pursued as a means to self-discovery so for example on my most recent visit to India I have a very dear friend who's a flute master he makes flutes and he performs and he teaches he's called Ravi Shankar Mishra and this year there was this one weekend when he was hosting a man called Lion Leifer and Lion had gone to India in 1964 on a Ful Fulbright scholarship as a very talented young flautist and he had learnt there to play the Bansuri, the Indian bamboo flute with and he'd met the man who became his guru, Devendra Murdeshwar, one of the greatest Bansuri exponents of the last century. So I met Lion very recently in 2020, so he's been practicing daily, diligently, lovingly for more than 50 years. And that weekend, not only did Lion give a concert, one day he gave a workshop. And my friend Ravi said, James, you must come to the workshop. And I thought, I don't play the flute. Like, I, I, I don't, why would I come to the flute workshop? He said, no, 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 no. You, you come into the workshop, make, make, you know, just make sure of it. So when Ravi said this to me, I thought, okay, I, I must go. It was one of the most beautiful experiences I've had in India. And that's saying a lot. But this man, for 56, well, that was since he began the Indian flute, he was already a very adept at the silver flutes. Let's say 60 years he'd been playing the flute every day. And in their lineage, Ravi, when he gave me my first harmonium, and he said, you know, James, if you, I tell my students, if they're gonna play the flute, the most important thing is to love the flute. And when you play, play for God, he says doesn't matter who's listening, whether you're playing for you by yourself, whether you're playing for people who you share your house with, your family, or whether you're playing in front of the Royal Albert Hall, or wherever it might be, or you're making a recording for the All India Radio, always play for God. Always play as a way of expressing your gratitude to existence for the gift of life and this opportunity to be a vehicle through which harmony and beauty can move and you can experience these things. So in their lineage they emphasize this very, you could say devotional approach, this approach that brings a lot of presence to the playing of the instrument. And Lion at this workshop spoke about his history with the flute, but every word he said, it was just so utterly captivating, so moving, he spoke with such humility. But it was so obvious that his practice of the flute was a yoga practice. As he had entered deep into that body of knowledge, that discipline of art and music and expression, that has become a mirror for his deeper self. And so there's the idea that any discipline, any art, any craft, any science that you really orient yourself to as an offering honoring the gifts of your consciousness by giving them a way to express themselves gracefully beautifully that expresses appreciation can become a yoga and yoga is very multi-purpose it's very inclusive and one of the beauties of the indian method is this inclusivity this is one of the reasons why in the indian system that which we sometimes refer to as god goes by so many names so when i was at school i learned some useful things like i mentioned the green cross code stop look listen very good advice for life <laughs> very good foundational yoga practice i find myself in a situation i don't know what to do well stop pause that's a heroic action in the world today in which so often we're busy, 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 stop, check in. Am I really acting in the way I would like to act? 
Is my action the expression of my true deepest longing? Look, listen. But as well as learning some very, very useful things at school, I was also given some misleading information. One thing I was told was that Hinduism, which is the Indian religious expression, you might say, was a polytheistic religion, which is not really accurate, because in the Indian system, God, or the Supreme, or Consciousness, is one. But it goes by countless names. Why? to remind us that the name is not it. The particular form is not it. So you can go to a temple dedicated to a particular representation of that which is beyond representation in India, for example, a Shiva temple. But inside that Shiva temple grounds, you may also see iconography that represents other representations of that which is beyond representation, other representations of the divine, of consciousness of the ultimate. So yoga comes from India. It comes from the Sanskrit tradition. It comes from a practical tradition which is inclusive, which is never absolute, which acknowledges the nuance, the grey of life. And this is really important to remember. When we study yoga, as people who have grown up in modern times, we have in our awareness what we might call certain veiling, certain prejudices. When we meet something, we meet it through the lenses of our accumulated ideas and conditionings. And oftentimes, we don't recognize how skewed or particular or partial our ways of looking are. One of the main practices in yoga is to practice looking in ways that reach beyond our habitual ways of looking. To practice thinking in ways that reach beyond our impatterned ways of thinking. That's not easy. But the yoga system gives us robust ways to do that. And as we practice stopping looking, listening, observing ourselves, we often invite the type of experience that helps us recognize how we are blinkered sometimes, how we do have blind spots. It's normal. We're a human being. We've got just two eyes. And consequently, there's always more that we cannot see than we can. We cannot even see all of ourself. I can try. I can't even see all of myself. We have our blind spots. And we've all, we're all the product of our conditionings. I've met some really interesting people in India, including some people who are considered great masters. But even they, they still see the world through the lens of their accumulated conditionings. So, why am I mentioning this? As well as being a product of consciousness, based on the observation of nature, the teachings and methods of yoga are also very much part of an Indian tradition, a Sanskrit tradition, a great, great, jaw-droppingly brilliant tradition. One that I feel we have to make an effort to approach with, tr with appropriate reverence and care to be able to receive the amazing gifts it has for us. Because it can be easy to approach it almost taking its riches for granted and then perhaps blinkering ourselves to its greater riches. So undoubtedly, I would say yoga belongs to all of humanity because it's the deepest longing of the human heart and soul. However, it's part of an Indian tradition and when we approach those texts, those teachings, those methods, it's really helpful to remember that those texts and teachings were set down in a culture a context that's very different from the one that we are familiar with, that we may, be, we may be used to operating within. So Patanjali, for example, when he wrote the Yoga Sutra, he wasn't writing it to get a publishing deal. He was writing it for all time. The Yoga Sutra is not a book that you give away once you've read it once, because it's designed to be a companion manual for the whole journey of practice, for the whole of our life. So, three ideas to begin with. Where does yoga come from? 
It comes from consciousness. It's a product of consciousness. It's a natural overflow of consciousness's desire to come back to the wholeness that it really is. The teachings of yoga came to us because of the grace and the efforts, the diligent, steady, honest efforts of rishis, research scientists, who had the patience and presence to stop, look and listen and observe nature, observe the reality of life and existence of which we're all part. And yoga's part of the Indian tradition and the Sanskrit tradition.